Um, welcome everyone to the Middle East Forum's weekly webinar, one of our weekly webinars. My name is Winfield Myers. I'm the director of Campus Watch and I'll be our host today. Our guest this afternoon is Raymond Ibrahim. Uh, Ray is the Judith Friedman Rosen Fellow at the Middle East Forum and a Shulman Fellow at the David Horowitz Freedom Center. Uh, Ray earned his BA and MA in history at Cal State Fresno and studied toward a PhD in medieval Islamic history at the Catholic University of America. Um, he was born in the U.S. to Coptic immigrants from Egypt, uh, which is why he knows a great deal about the Middle East, as you'll see. Uh, and Ray is the author of several books. His most uh, recent is Sword and Scimitar, 14 Centuries of War Between Islam and the West. Ray, welcome. Great to have you here. Great to see you again. Great to be with you, Winfield. Thanks. Thank you. Good, good to have you. Um, our, our topic today is Islam and the and academic myths um, uh, that proliferate in university life about Islam and, and um, the Middle East uh, in general. Um, this could go in a lot of directions, but, but Ray, to start, uh, where do these come from? Where do the myths that we're going to discuss about Islam in academe uh, originate? And then we'll get into some of the more uh, important of those myths that, in, in your views. Yeah, sure, Wayne. Like you said, very complex and long and deep topic, um, but to get to the heart of it, um, and I think really before I can answer your question, I have to lay a little groundwork, which is uh, sure, sure. The, the actual history, uh, especially of Islam vis-a-vis -vis the West, which is, um, if you look at, again, you look at the primary sources, the chronicles, European, Arab, Turkish, it's one of hostility continuously. Sure, there's, you know, little breaks and, and, and whatnot, not because there's a change in the mentality uh, of, you know, being open-minded towards each other or, or any of that sort of thing, but just because of the exigencies of reality and real politics and so forth. Um, but it's, it's continuous warfare from the seventh century on Islam. Again, most people don't realize uh, most of the land that it's on was uh, annexed, conquered, and absorbed from mostly Christian uh, nations. So all of North Africa and the Middle East, from Morocco in the West to Iraq, even Syria, of course, Egypt, all that whole area. Later, the Turks enter into Anatolia, which is primarily Greek, also very Christian. It's the area where most of St. Paul's letters, for example, go to those churches. Um, and all the way into the Balkans, all of that was <clears throat> violent. Spain as well in the 8th century was conquered. And so, um, you know, and historians have done this, they've actually gotten the numbers and, you know, did graft it. Basically, three quarters of what was originally Christian territory was conquered and absorbed by Islam, most of it permanently. Russia as well, you know, you hear of the Mongol or Tatar yoke, and it come, it's usually depicted in a secular manner, but that as well really fit into this whole Islam, Christianity, hostility paradigm, especially later when the Mongols convert in the 1300s and so forth, the Golden Horde. Um, and so really it's one of nonstop violence for well over a millennium from the seventh century, from the death of Muhammad, the war begins two years later uh, against the Byzantine or Eastern Roman Empire. And it goes on in various iterations. You have the Moors or the Berbers in Spain, and then you have the Arabs, and then you get the, the Turks and you get you know, very, the Seljuks and the Ottomans, and it's very long and violent. <clears throat> and now we come to our perception, which is really the opposite. Um, and that's what you're asking. So how did we go from that being reality <clears throat> to now we're really presented with something completely topsy-turvy. Um, and it goes back to the, you know, academics. Uh, that's where, really where it starts. Uh, today in our culture, I think we're familiar with the concept of fake news, which whatever political spectrum you may be on, I think it's obvious that there's a lot of exaggeration because the reality is um, knowledge is power as that old axiom goes and whoever controls it has the power. So it's clear that a lot of people in the media and so forth are manipulating and, and twisting stories around for their own agendas. But that sort of thing goes way before, especially in this field and including amongst academics. And, um, uh, it's, and it, the, the reason it works, and this is a, a, an interesting aspect that very few people really mention, is, as you know, when you, if you're in a graduate course in history and you're writing a master's thesis or a dissertation, PhD and whatever, <clears throat> the whole point is you always have to come up with something new. It's, you can't just rehash and summarize something that happened. You have to give a new insight and a new interpretation. And so if the history of Islam and the West, or really Islam and everyone and the rest, is one of violence and you're a student, <laughs> immediately that sets up the um, situation for your dissertation to be the exact opposite because it won't do to just reiterate. Um, so you mentioned, for example, my book, Sword and Scimitar. Well, that's just a summation and a reiteration of accurate history. 
But if you're writing a, a dissertation or so forth, you need to come up with a new clever thing. So that going hand in hand with the political culture since the 60s and so forth of, you know, multiculturalism, you know, the, the boogeyman of racism and imperialism and, of course, Orientalism. And I think that's where we need to get to with Edward Said and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, fused that together. 1978 so, book, uh, Orientalism. Right. Yes. right. So that book and that mentality and, you know, that book. If you've read it, tell us sure briefly what, what, uh, what, it, what it amounted to, just very briefly. So the book Orientalism by Edward Said, a Palestinian um, academic uh, who's a literary critic, uh, and he's not even a historian and so forth. The whole point of the book was just to say that the, what I told you, right, uh, which is documented, is a perception. It's a false perception that was foisted by Orientalists, which are European academics who studied the Orient, the East, Islam, and so forth in the 1800s and, and even before that 1700s and well into the 1900s people like bernard lewis were of course accused of being an orientalist and they are orientalists but in the good sense uh, it's just it's just studying the east but of course that word now has a negative connotation which means you're not objective you're not really looking at the people and understanding all you do is you just you sit back and you from an, and you because you're the west uh, have a superior outlook and you look at the East as barbaric and backwards and primitive, especially Islam. You're and, projecting um, your own views onto right. other, the other. Right, other right. And, like it, that. And, it, and it has a psychoanalytical aspect, which I think also kind of really <laughs> lessens its uh, credibility, in my opinion. So that thing, that idea, that paradigm, which was really, I guess, uh, ushered in by Edward Said. And again, I, I would underscore, you know, it, it it only became important because the culture was receptive to that sort of thing at that sure. time. So the two went together. So like I was saying, we're living in a day and age where, you know, so Western history is sort of has to be looked at as bad. It's imperialistic. It's racist. It's xenophobic and, and you know, everything. And Islam is the opposite for, like, for reasons I said, including if you want to be a clever academic, you have to come up with something new. So what's better than to show how actually, no, Islam was peaceful, progressive. In Western Europe and so forth, were the negative ones and, and or the violent ones. Um, let me let me ask you what, what happened to the the, the old um, the older schools of Orientalists, as you say, who wore that badge unashamedly. No one no one told them there was anything wrong with doing it. Uh, even the generation before uh, Lewis, um, these guys who studied uh, philology, they studied languages, they became expert in uh, Arabic, Hebrew, Aramaic, all the various um, ancient languages of the Middle East. Um, the, the whole Orientalist impetus really shoved them aside, didn't it? I mean, it, it, gave, a, it gave a reason, as you say, new things uh, are awarded in academia, new ideas. You're always looking for what's going to be the newest approach to any particular historical problem. But what we've seen, it seems to me, over the last, um, say, 20, 30 years, is a almost a wholesale jettisoning of the um, previous, I hate to overuse the word overuse paradigm, but the previous paradigms, the previous historiography of the Middle East, uh, in which it's become now very combative, uh, always on the offensive. Uh, uh, there's a, um, a political edge to it now that was surely missing, say, when I was born uh, uh, into the 60s, and, and it really, really changed that. What, what happened with that, and, and what do you see as the, pri the primary problems? What, what are the historiographical problems, the problems that, are, that the myths that we're discussing today that are emerging from academia? What are the principal myths? since we can only sort of hit the high spots today um, uh, that you see coming out. Well, well one of the, the aspects that, you know, I think it's again very subtle, and I think this is what's going on, is, um, you know, we live in a culture where history isn't considered that important, okay? It's not, I think it's very important. I think you do too, and I'm sure much of the audience agrees. Um, and it is important, and I think a lot of Islamists and, and so forth to know that. And I'll give you an example. What's going on is, um, when 9-11 happened, let's say, okay, and this is really when Islam and radical Islam, you know, makes a big splash in, the, in our era. Um, a lot of people, the big question was what, what went wrong? You know, I think Bernard Lewis kind of, mm. you know, rhetorically asked it. And it, it, that question presupposed the history. And, and that's the thing, see, and it, it, because <laughs> what went wrong means something was right beforehand, right? And um, so it presupposed that Islam for, you know, the beginning of its, all, all its history, especially vis-a-vis -vis the West, was an okay force. Sure, they had their conflicts, but that's because of the Crusaders, and that's because of you know imperialistic Western colonialist actions and so forth. Um, now, 
if if you if you change that first premise of history, if you go with what I'm saying, for example, that actually no, it was a, it was a continuous um, you know a continuum of warfare and violence, mostly initiated by Islam, which was spreading into and absorbing and conquering the West and other lands. Uh, that question, what went wrong, becomes a moot point. It's superfluous because nothing went wrong. This is we're actually seeing a continuum, right? Um, so I think there's this um, uh, an impetus to really guard the narrative, the historical. And I'll just give you a very ob- a personal, ex- my own personal experience. I've been invited and spoken in, in various places. The greatest pushback I ever got was when I was talking about history, and that, that was at the U.S. Army War College. And they sure. just invited me to talk about my book, uh, Sword and Scimitar, which you mentioned, which is history, what I'm saying. And that's the most time that care just went ballistic and attacked me. And you would think, big deal, I'm just talking battles, decisive battles and warfare. And I think the point is they don't want it because once you realize that Islam was doing what it's been doing for over a millennium, and in fact, what we're seeing today is an identical duplication of that, then you understand nothing went wrong. There's nothing to fix. There's no... There's no you know, so, but as long as you believe that that history, that the history is what the apologists and the, and the Edward Said types want you to believe, okay, then you have to always look for something other than radical Islam to explain what's going on. And so it becomes colonialism, it becomes Israel and Zionism, it becomes, you know, um, um, Western machinations, whatever, um, anything and everything about Islam, because Islam was fine historically, so obviously it's something else. And I think that's a very subtle um reason that a lot of the apologists work very hard to guard the historical narrative. Mm -hmm. But the the term Islamophobia, um, which is thrown around a great deal now, there are centers devoted to um, what I would call the the, the propaganda of Islamophobia at Georgetown and at Berkeley, both, not your way, Mm -hmm. Um, both dedicated to, I would argue, um, not so much furthering the debate about Islam in any way or the Near East, but instead uh, to shutting down critics of Islamism, uh, of, of the more radical strains or, 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 or critics of uh, writing what we used to call straight history, uh, sort of political history, intellectual history, diplomatic history. Um, how do you explain this burst onto the scene over the last uh, couple of decades or so of the term Islam, Islamophobia? which is now um, used everywhere in academia. And it, it's tied into intersectionality and it becomes part of an entire uh, sort of leftist uh, push yeah. to silence critics. Yeah, and I think that's the ma- main point. You have to see it as part of a whole, which is this idea of you know, getting these name calling essentially and shutting up uh, any kind of uh, discussion. And you see this, especially today with the word racism, which is just bandied about very loosely in, you know, which is unfortunate. There is real racism in the world, sure. but when you use it for everything, then it loses its potency. You know, it's a, and so it's the same thing with Islamophobia. You know, you, instead of having a healthy debate, um, you just shut it down. And you, so Islamophobic means the same thing as you know. The, it's it's there's that whole group of words. You know, we're racist and patriarchy and masculine toxicity and you know, um, and, you know, misogynist. And you put Islamophobic in there too. So all of these, I think, are just ways when, when the opposition can't actually debate you and have an, an actual rational discussion and show how you're wrong, because in the end, objective truth wins out, you just shut them down, you silence them. That's the whole idea, which is amazing to see. And it's sad to see academics championing this sort of thing, because they're supposed to be the ones who believe in free thought and inquiry and, sure, and it's so, to be about and debate, so forth. Right. Rigorous debate about right. the, the and search of the truth. Yeah, that, That's what it should be, right? And, and that's, that's really the sad thing to see the academic world by and large, not all of course, mm-hmm. but it's, you know, it's, it's spirit is more or less become, you know, all about censorship and shutting down and, you know, just following the official paradigms or, you know, mm-hmm. the official presentation. And it used to actually be more of a, I don't want to use the word rebel, but it was, you know, it goes against the, the, the grain, you know, against the stream. Um, right. And it, because it's trying to think clearly and get objective truth. And that's not where we're at. And again, I would, un- I would emphasize it's not, a, it's not a, a, an isolated case. You're seeing it in so many different ways, in, by and large, in American culture today. Sure, sure. Well, let me ask you another thing before we go to our audience, the wow. questions we're getting a few in. And if you have questions, please please type them, and, and we'll be eager to, uh, to answer them. Um, why the obsession with, the, with Israel-Palestine, with uh, BDS that we're seeing now, you know, the Middle East Studies Association uh, is voting as we speak, and members have until the March 22nd to vote on the, uh, whether or not they will adopt BDS, boycott, sanction, uh, divestment and sanction of Israel as 
part of their platform to mm -hmm. make it their official policy. Uh, when I think of Middle East studies today, uh, if, if you have to put one topic at the top of the heap that receives more attention than anything else, it's got to be Israel. It's got to be attacks on Zionism. Yeah. The, the whole why? Where did that come from? Why? Why that? Well, it comes. It comes from the fact that it's Muslims and Arabs who are guiding this, and obviously Muslims and Arabs hate and have animosity for Israel because they see it as a great foe that supposedly took their land and the Palestinians and so forth. But it's unfortunate that, you know, non-Muslims, non-Arabs, regular academics and so forth follow, follow this because if you want to be objective, there's so many other, you know, things that you can talk about that are much, much worse. Uh, one example that I focus on is the, you know, uh, pandemic of Christian persecution by Muslim nations. And um, this is actually very appropriate to the topic of Israel that you bring up, because I just read a book uh, written by um, his name is Mitri Rahib, um, and he's a Palestinian. And the book is called The Politics of Persecution, and it purports to talk about persecution in the Middle East of Christians. And really, the book is focused on Israel, and it tries to demonize and present Israel as the worst persecutor of, of Christians. And um, that when persecution, but when persecution happens from Muslims, which is way much larger in scope and much more dramatic. In fact, the, the examples of Israel are, are always the same two or three, which have to do with some radical youth spitting at like um, a monk or something. You know, that's all they ever, but the persecution that Christians experience in the Islamic world is, is dramatically and exponentially worse. That gets no mention. So I, I mentioned that book as one example, but others can look at that. I mean, most people don't even know that. Um, I just read a report, something like 380 million Christians around the world are being persecuted heavily. 80% of it is in the Islamic world. You would think from people who pre, pre, you know, present themselves as having a humanitarian inclination, and that's why they're talking about the Palestinians, that they might talk about that, but they don't. Okay, And, and, and the thing with the Palestinians, I mean, that's a territorial secular dispute, and yet they try to turn it into something more, something of an existential sure. nature, which is actually what's happening to Christians and, and other non-Muslim minorities, including Shias and so forth, amongst the uh, Sunni majorities. Sure. Well, let's take a few questions from the audience then, uh, Ray. Um, Rochelle, I can't quite make out the last name, says, are Muslims taught about the relationship between the Quran and the Bible and how much of it seems uh, similar but reworded? Is there knowledge within you know, the, the schools of Islam, for an average person, I'm talking about, I mean, scholars who would be more familiar with it, uh, of, of that question? Yeah, uh, well, I mean, the, the main thing I'd like to say about the Quran and Islam and, um, you know, the Bible. And because we heard a lot of, you know, this ecumenical talk and Pope Francis and, you know, Ahmed Al-Tayyab of Sheikh Al-Azhar and so forth, meeting and hugging and kissing each other. And uh, the idea that's always presented to us is that because the Quran and Islam actually names and even venerates many biblical figures, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, uh, you know, everyone, that that's a good thing. The reality is it's actually a bad thing because what happens is it's an appropriation Okay, so for example, uh, the New Testament or Christians, uh, Christians refer to, they look to the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament as it's called, but they don't change it. It's the verbatim scriptures that the Jews also rely on. So nothing's changed in that sense. Okay, now maybe interpretations change, but the actual text has not changed. So Abraham is who Abraham was and what he said is what he said and Moses and so forth. What Muslims do though, and what Islam does is it takes the names and it uses the, you know, the, their, the antiquity and the prestige of those names and the authority, but then it completely recasts it in a way that justifies and um, gives credibility to Islam and denigrates Christianity and, uh, and, uh, and Judaism. So for example, Abraham in the, in the, the Islamic tradition, Ibrahim, my namesake, um, in he, so in the, in the Bible, he just, he leaves you know, the, the land of Ur and that's it. And he goes, he goes west. Um, in Islam, he tells his people, and this is in the Quran, Quran 64, Ibrahim says, we hate you and we will forever hate you until you become Muslims, essentially. Now, until th this day, Muslims use that verse of Abraham, Ibrahim, to basically say we are obligated to hate Muslim, uh, um, to hate Jews and Christians. Okay, so it's an appropriation and uh, the same thing with Jesus, uh, Isa. Okay, he's taken, and what Jesus is going to do when he comes back is he's going to destroy all the crosses because he was never crucified, and he's angry at Christians for saying that he was, and he was resurrected, and he's going to kill all the pigs, and he's going to become a good Muslim, and or he is a good Muslim. 
So my point is that sort of thing, far from creating commonality, actually, I think creates obstacles. It's like if someone were to tell you, you know, you have a grandfather that you love and venerate, and then someone comes and says, hey, that's my grandfather too. And guess what? Everything you know about him is wrong. You have to listen to what I have to say about him. So that, I don't think that really helps. Sure, sure. Um, Lynn Levin, or Levin uh, asks, why don't uh, Western Christians stand up for their co-religionists in the Arab world? That's, that's, that's a good question. Um, I, I would say a lot of it, you know, a lot of it is sectarian uh, in the sense that, you know, the, the Christian world is split up into all these different sects and the Western world is more, mostly Protestant. Um, the Christians of the Middle East are mostly Orthodox. Um, so to a lot of Protestants, they don't even acknowledge that they're Christians to start with, um, you know. Uh, that's, just, that's just one reason. I don't think that's a major reason. I think another one has to do with ignorance because the media, like I said, you know, it, the persecution of Christians around the world is a real thing. Something like 6,000 were killed last year for their faith, butchered. Um, but the media doesn't cover it. And I remember that when 21 Coptic Christians or 20 cops and one Ghanaian uh, were beheaded by ISIS in Libya in 2014 or 15 for their faith, and it was carved off, uh, someone did some number crunching, and it turned out that the media covered, uh, at the same time, a gorilla in some American zoo was killed. Oh, I okay. remember that, yeah. Right. Yeah, so, and that's why you remember it, because that was yeah. covered six times that's more. Right. Than, I remember the, the juxtaposition. Yeah, 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 yeah right. Yeah. So um, I think a lot of it has to do with ignorance, because the media obviously is not doing sure. its job, because this because anything that shows Islam in a negative light just throws a wrench into the well, History is just so poorly taught, including American history. Or yeah. these days. I mean, people don't know, they don't, right. they don't know history much. Yeah. An anonymous attendee asks, are most of these Western academics simply anti-Christian and anti-Jewish because they 100% believe the Muslim side of any disputes and arguments? Or, I would say, or they, yeah. you know, why do, why, why would a Westerner, whether Jewish or Christian, um, be so susceptible to this? Uh, yeah, know, I do not believe. Not all because they're anti-Christian or anti-Semitic. It's, it's, right. it's, it's more innocent than that, I think, for them. Yeah. I think so, but I do think there's a uh, there's a sort of synergism between it's it's strange because you find an alliance it's been called you know the red green alliance and sure. so forth uh, between the left and uh, you know especially and the more hardcore the left goes the more it's embedded with Islamist types which is ironic because the left is really antithetical to Islam in many mm -hmm. social mores and and so forth you know and let's think about you know sexual freedom in the minds of the left sure. compared to the much more traditional form so but the, you often find them and I do believe when you see that it is because the left have an animosity for Jews and Christians, basically the West's background, you know, Judeo-Christian tradition, um, a hatred for it, I think. And um, mm -hmm. so it's almost like the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Okay, so the Islamists are, are, are exotic and foreign, and I'm not worried about them. But I, in, in allying with them, I can actually, you know, have some sort of um, support against what I really don't like in my society, which is this sort of Judeo-Christian uh, ethical system. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um... Someone asks, uh, <clears throat> are the middle, uh, anonymous attendee again asks, uh, are the Middle Eastern Christians afraid to show positive support for Israel, which is this person's perception? Yeah, well, it's a matter of um, Israel in the, in the Islamic world, and especially in the Middle East, as you know, is, is you know, the arch enemy. It's the great foe. And if you're a Christian, you're already a second class minority who's, you know, ostracized and disenfranchised. So the best thing you want to do is try to assimilate uh, with the host nation, with, Mus with the Muslims in general. And this is why for a lot of um, Arab Christians in the 20th century, early and late in the late 19th century, were very pro-Arab nationalism, uh, because that was one way for them sure. to be part of the group, you know, as, instead of being Christian. So I do believe, and I actually I know this for a fact, and speaking to a lot of Christians who live there, that they have to maintain this sort of, you know, we have to be on the same page with our Muslim neighbors when it comes to Israel. We can't be like, oh, and you see this because many of them, when they come here, it changes and that whole thing drops, um, you know. And anyway, there's actually been some progress because I know in Egypt for a long time with the, the Coptic Pope Shenouda, um, he actually had a ban to visiting Israel, but that's been dropped. So the new, the new Pope um, and has shown much more leniency towards that, which is actually a, an impressive step in the context of what's going on. But I think it also has to do with Egypt's uh, politics overall with mm -hmm. Sisi and so forth. So yeah, it's just, it, that's, that's, real, that's real politics sort of thing. Where, sure. uh, and, and most of the Christians in the Middle East don't even know anything about what's going on, but hey, it's the enemy. And uh, that's what everyone said. So who are we to come on their side when we're already, you know, 
on a thin line. Sure, sure. Uh, Hal asks or says, there was a long pause between Islam's conquering Christian lands and the current Islamic violence. How can you see this as one continuous process? No, there's been, there's been aberrations. And so, of course, the colonial era, you can say, is an aberration. And that went on from really starting in the 1800s. I mean, look, from the very first attack in the West is in the 7th seventh, seventh century. And one of the biggest battles, for example, that really opened the floodgates is the Battle of the Armuk in the year 636. Okay, now go more than 1,000 years, you're in 1683. And now you have the largest Islamic attack on Europe, which is the Siege of Vienna. Okay, that's now, now we're in 1683. But then you have, a, you know, then the Ottoman Empire starts waning. And then, but you, you have the Barbary pirates in America's first war in 1800. And again, in 1815 is with Muslims. First war as a nation after its independence with Muslims who were saying the same thing. And, you know, Thomas Jefferson writes that famous letter where he quotes the ambassador of Barbary saying, we are attacking your sailors because you're infidels in our book, our Quran says to do so and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, so, but from 1800 to now, of course, the Islamic world wanes and, you know, the, the symbolic date really is I think 1799 with Napoleon entering Egypt. And so you definitely get a whole, what, what, and that's actually often called, for example, the golden age for the Christian minorities of the middle age, the colonial era, because it actually helped create an even playing field and religion was pushed aside. And that's when nationalism, like I was saying, but now we're seeing a return very much. And so ISIS, in, in fact, most people don't know this, the very words it uses in the formulations are, are words that were used from over a thousand years ago. The Battle of Yarmouk that I just mentioned in 636, when ISIS, which they've done, comes up and says, we've tasted American blood and find none better. That's a verbatim quote from Khalid bin al-Walid, the sword of Islam at that battle, talking to the Romans or the, the Eastern Romans, the Byzantines. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, to me, it's definitely a continuum, but of course there's aberrations and hiccups, even if they took one or two centuries. Robert Larrick asks, do conservative Muslims hate liberal Muslims? And more secular um, who want, that is the more secular Muslims who uh, advocate for human or women's rights and the like. Right. Well, I mean, split within Islam, not just Sunni Shia, but, but between secular, more secularized, more westernized, if you will, and, uh, and more traditional. Yeah, sure. Uh, but, you know, I, I would I would shy away from using those words, conservative and liberal, well, because I don't, I, don't, I don't think they apply well in the I mean, Islamic. Do we see this within the academy? Does this ever show up in, in, in university life as well? Oh, you mean conservative and liberal? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm throwing that in to, uh, to his yeah. question. Yeah, yeah, it's, 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 it's the same, you know, all these different iterations, whether it's the Islam or in the academic world, you see the same thing. But in the Islamic world, um, it, to me, it just it's, it's plain and simple. And, and when you use these terms and the dichotomy of liberal and conservative, it just doesn't really work in my mind with the Islam, uh, you know, the Malou, because it, Islam is very black and white. You know, you have laws, rules which is in Sharia, which really don't have in, let's say, Christianity, especially not in Western modern day Christianity, you know, hard set black and white, you have to do this, right? So it's, it's to me, it's not a question of it, to be liberal. So for example, in Islam, um, you, can have, you, you can beat your wife, it's in the Quran, you can have four wives. Uh, am I a liberal to say, no, I don't want to do that? Or am I actually contradicting what Islam teaches? And uh, that's, that's more the debate that goes on. And so the so-called conservatives will say what I just said which is whatever you're talking about, that mean, that's just Western stuff. But our book, our Holy Quran, and so forth, and our Sharia says X, Y, and Z. And that, so it really comes down to that. So, yeah, let me ask you that. Uh, um, the professors that we critique at Campus Watch and that you've written about and, and, and read, um, generally, in my impression, are not practicing Muslims. Some of them are, obviously, but a lot of them are, are quite secularized. Um, yet they are uh, virulently anti-Israel, many of them are anti-Semitic, uh, anti-Western. Um, what explains that? Uh, I don't mean just those who are even Muslim, even, even those of uh, whatever the background, English background, or, you know, or if they're Jewish or whatever they happen to be. Um, what explains that in academia that, that they're so inimical to the West, um, to uh, the traditional study of Western history, as you outlined it earlier, or to the study of Islam, get back to our original point, um, as let's say it, it, it should be studied and as some like you and others still, uh, still in fact write about it. Well, I'll just say, because I know our time is very limited, it's uh, at, at, at root, it's, an ira it's irrational. Okay, There's, so it, it can't be explained in a rational, logical sense. I think it's ultimately an irrational hatred and an irrational animosity. I think a lot of it, it really has to do with, 
a sort of rejection of those people rejecting their heritage, their roots, you know, which, which, which includes Israel in that sense, because it's part of the, you know, the sure. biblical tradition and so forth. Sure. Sure. Um, I think that's at root, but ultimately, to me, it's very irrational, because, it, it, and again, you know, when you see this, these hardcore leftists who are so pro whatever, homosexual rights, and, you know, the people who believe in this, you know, there's no gender, you find them going hand in hand with radical Muslims, who are the same people who would behead them in an heartbeat. Um, and uh, so it's at root, very irrational. And the, the linchpin that holds all these diverse groups together is, I think, hatred for the what we would call the Western anyway, tradition. Sure, sure. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time. We could go, this, could, this is a discussion that we could carry on for a long time, and, and it would be fascinating to do that. But um, our guest has been Raven Ibrahim. Um, right? Thank you so much for, for speaking with us today. We really appreciate it. It's great to talk to you again. And um, for the rest of our audience, please remember that to watch for an MEF email that will appear over the weekend with additional webinars. So thanks, thanks again to Ray. Thank you to our audience. And good afternoon, everyone.